Hello once again. It is so good to see everybody. Hi, my name is Eric Bucci, and I'm the lead pastor here at Cornerstone Church. If this is your first time here in person or online, or if you've not been here in a long time, we want to welcome you. Thank you so much for being here today. We always like to let people know how much we love them. Can you guys tell everyone, show a lot of love. Everyone, on, come on, nice and loud. Let them know you love them. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's so good to see everyone today. We are in a series on First Peter called Unshakable. And what we're dealing with is we're going through the book of First Peter. And I really encourage you to go home and read the book of First Peter and reread it. We're going to be going through it today quite a bit, actually. And a very important element of it is talking about who, are, who we are in Christ. And just to remind everybody who Peter was, Peter was a disciple of Jesus. He was one of the top three out of the twelve. And, and also Peter wrote this book in about 55 to 65 A.D., and uh, this is a time when the church was going through a lot of shaking. Have you guys known a lot of shaking been going on the last, uh, last year? So he was experiencing that. The church was dispersed. The church was being persecuted. I'm not going to re-preach what I did before. You can go to cornerstonecheshire.com and catch up on our series. Or you can go to iTunes or Spotify, type in Cornerstone Cheshire, and hit subscribe and rate it, please. And you'll get a, something in your mailbox so you can listen to it and you're driving or whatever, and catch up to what's happening, okay? But today we're going up talking about how do you handle situations when things are shaking? How can you become unshakable? And I, I think what sometimes I've experienced things in the past that I thought I couldn't handle it anymore. But after I went through it, I realized I was stronger. And it's my prayer that through 20, 2020 and, and going through what we went through, that you and I can learn when we get out of this pandemic, when we move to the other side, that we can be stronger because of it. So that's our prayer today. So we're doing Unshakable. Today I want to talk about something very interesting. There was a man by the name of Timothy Henry Gray back in 2011 in Nebraska. These young boys were, were, were sleigh riding and they went down and they went to an underpass and they found this thing in the snow. It was a dead body. And the person they found was Timothy Henry Gray. And so he died of hypothermia. It was a very sad thing. And, and they brought him to the coroners and they did all the investigations. But they found out and they had, they found out this guy had, he was a homeless person. He had a cashier's check in his pocket for a lot of money. But he was homeless. Not only that, but they also found out that he was related to Hugh Clark, whose estate was valued at $306 million, who died in 2011 and left him an inheritance of 19 million dollars. That's a lot of money, right? And so this gentleman was living under a bridge. This gentleman was homeless and did not realize it. His brother later on said, that he said and he, and his, his older brother Jerry said that his brother struggled with mental health issues and he didn't realize what he had. You know, I think a lot of us struggle with our minds, not knowing whose we are and what we have in Christ Jesus. That we're living in a poverty mentality. And I'm not talking about, this is not a get rich sermon. We're going to go out and buy a, you know, buy a BMW X5 or something like that. Uh, M5, X5, not just a 5, but get the M if you're going to get a BMW. Okay, that's beside the point. 
<laughs> we're not just talking about living the high, high life. No, we're talking about living below what we're called to live. And we don't realize that we're wealthy. We don't realize that God has given us an inheritance that is so amazing. In fact, what this guy's, what Henry Grace, uh, what he had is nothing compared to what God has given us. God has given us wonderful things. But we live way below our means because we don't realize. You see, your identity leads you to your destiny. Your identity leads you to your destiny. So if you don't believe the right things about yourself, then you don't get to your destiny. And the enemy's job simply is this. His job is to try to get us to believe lies about who God is and who you are. The two most important thoughts that you could ever have at any moment is this. What you think about God and what you think about yourself. The two most important things you can get right. And so you might think right things about God, but wrong things about yourself. So your identity leads to your, de to your destiny. And if you're an enemy, what I want to do is I want to fool you. The enemy wants to fool you and have you live below your means, not living in who you are or whose you are, and living in poverty and, and walking around like a homeless person when you have a home. Not only do you have a home, you have resources. So Peter is writing to the early church about this. And he's talking about what your identity is. And today there's a lot of confusion about identity. Have you noticed that, everybody? Yeah. Well, I would tell you, I, I hear people saying, well, I'm a Republican. I'm a Democrat. I'm, I'm, none of the, uh, I'm none of the above. I'm a child of God. Yeah, I'm Italian-American, and I'm proud of both of them, particularly the, the Italian part and the German part. But I am first a child of God. We just sang about that. I am a child of God. And that's beyond anything. So, who are you? Is what we're going to look at today. Who are you? Who are you and who am I? There was an old song by the Who. I'm, <laughs> a great song, actually, called Who Are You? Who, who, who? I really want to know. Well, that's a good thing to know. You need to know who you are. You need to know whose you are. And today we're going to look at what is in your rights. What's the inheritance you have? You are living under a bridge. It's time for you to own the bridge. So, you are. This is First Peter. We, we are going to two, just two verses today, 9 and 10. It's what he talks about who you are. And by the way, this applies to people that have given their lives to Jesus Christ and have handed their lives over. You have not done that. This has not applied to you, but it can. Here it is. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who's called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So what we're going to do is we're going to break this down in the order of who you are and your identity, okay? So this is what we're going to do. If you're taking notes, uh, you can write this down. If you're not taking notes, write it down, okay? Who are you? But you are a chosen race. And the, the Greek word for race is, is genos, which is we get genetics, you know, genetics, that's where they get the word. We say Genesis. Genetics, uh, Genesis comes from that. Genetics. You are constituted something different. When you give your life to Christ, you are changed. The Bible says those who have given their lives to Christ, behold, all things have passed away. Behold, all things are new. You are new creation in Christ Jesus. So you are new creation. And we have to start thinking that we're a new creation and believing that we're a new creation. So God can do something. God can do gene therapy on you and I when we begin to believe the truth. In fact, there's neuroscience that's teaching us today that as a person thinks, so they become. It can even rewrite your DNA. There's enough studies out there, and I don't have time to get into all the studies, but there's at least 15 to 20 studies that I've read that shows that if you think the right thoughts and you believe the right things, you literally, not only you get right pathways in your mind, and you get highways in your mind to go to the right place, you actually can rewrite your DNA. 
That's why the Bible says that the word goes into the marrow of the bones. I mean, they had no idea what they were writing. They were not scientists, but now science is already proving what God has said in his word. So if you believe the right truth and let God's supernatural power touch you, you can rewrite who you are. But you are a chosen, you are a chosen race. You are chosen. You're not the frozen, but you're the chosen. People said that we're, we're the chosen frozen up here in New England. No, we're not. I, re I resent that. We're, not the, we're chosen, all right? So you are a chosen race. That's the first thing you are. In John 15, 16, this is what Jesus tells us. He says this, you did not choose me, but I chose you. People used to have this thing in the 1970s, I know I'm dating myself, called I found it. I found God. No, actually, God found you. So where's the choice? Are you Arminianism or are you Calvinism? We'll get to that in a few moments. But what does it mean that you're chosen? Well, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it. Now, that sounds like a pretty good deal to me, no? That you, yeah, I think I want to live in that kind of lifestyle, right? Yeah, that he chose you, that you know you're chosen, you know who you are, that you're part of a new race of people. You're a new race. I'm first a child of God. In fact, Jesus said something scandalous. One day he was teaching and his mother and his brothers, mother, the Mary of Jesus was outside with his brother, said, hey, come and get Jesus. And this is what Jesus said. Who are my mothers and brothers? He said, he who does my will is my mother and brothers. Jesus is putting the body of Christ even beyond family. Now, that's pretty amazing. Listen, don't misunderstand me. We're still called to honor our parents. We're still called to take care of our own, or you're worse than an infidel. The Bible says that. But there's something spiritually in eternity that the body of Christ is even greater than that. So, but God demonstrated his own love towards us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So we were not looking for him. He came looking for us. He let us catch him. Okay, you're chosen because you chose to respond to being chosen. All right, you are chosen. I know, great English. You are chosen because you chose to respond to, I don't know why I put, I'll get rid of my name now. I'm not trying to brag, okay. I don't know why that's there. I can take that away. I just thought of that. I even think I'm an arrogant jerk by having it up there. <laughs> you are chosen because you chose to respond to being chosen. This is what happened. You cho God chose you, but you're not going to be chosen until you accept that chosen. You have to believe you're chosen because you are. Well, how can you say that? Well, I'll, I'll show you real quickly in Scripture. It says, come to me. What does it say? Just some? Come to me some? No, it says all. Okay? You who labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Uh, for if this is good and acceptable in the sight of God. This is Timothy speaking. I mean, Paul speaking to Timothy. Who desires, what? All men to be saved. And to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard of this verse. Okay, the Tim Tebow verse, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that what? Whoever. Okay, his only begotten son that some that believe. No, whoever believes in him should not perish with everlasting life. So God's chosen you from the foundation of the earth. But you have to choose to be chosen. Well, what about, who cares? Just, God, you're chosen by God. You're not here by accident. There are accident parents. There are pregnancies that were not planned, but God planned you. If you're alive and you have a heartbeat and you have breath in your lungs, God has a redemption and a purpose for you. So you are a chosen ethnos. You are a chosen people group. You are God's DNA, everybody. Hello. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, my daddy can beat up your daddy type of thing. That's what we're talking about here. Your part, God is bigger than the boogeyman as we learn from Veggie Tales. Okay, if you don't know what that is, get over it. Okay. And here's another one. You are graced and forgiven. Grace is unmerited favor. You are pitied, in another word to say. In other words, you, you and I were a wreck without God. Okay, your grace. It says in verse 10, it says this. Once you have not received mercy... But now you have received mercy. Mercy. You don't deserve it. But God in his grace 
and his mercy accepts us, not because we have our act together, it's because we have our surrender together. If you have your surrender together, you're a good candidate to give your life to Christ. If you think you can do it on your own, you're not going to do very well. Now, this is what happens. One of the great books of the Bible, I know all of us read this book all the time. Hosea comes to the prophet and says, God comes to the Hosea, the prophet, and tells him in the book of Hosea, one of the prophets, marry that woman. Her name was Gomer. Do me a favor. If you ever have a daughter, do not name your daughter Gomer. Because Gomer was the most renowned prostitute in the Bible. I know there was Gomer Pyle, but don't get me started on that guy. Okay. So anyhow. So Gomer. Gomer. She was a prostitute. God said, marry this woman. And so he marries her. has children with her. He falls in love with her the whole nine yards. And she keeps running off and jumping into other men's beds. And he bring her back. She run off again. Bring her back. Run off again. Now. I don't know about this, but I think we kind of do the same thing spiritually. Jesus, I love you. But there's another, there's another woman on the side. There's another man on the side, right? I have someone else on the side. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not, my, my fidelity is not completely to God. See, this is what happened. And so God, I mean, if I ever go to heaven, when I go to heaven one day, I'm going to put my arm around Jose and say, man, dude, I'm really sorry for what you had to go through. Thanks for the book. But man, I'm so glad it wasn't me. Bum deal, pal. No, I'm, <laughs> I mean, poor guy, right? I mean, aren't you glad you're not Hosea? Tell your neighbor, I'm, I'm glad I'm not Hosea. Okay. And Hosea, we're sorry. Okay, let's move on. But what basically happened is he said, marry that woman. And so this is what takes place. And then we go, we see in the scripture verse here, then I will sow her for myself and the earth, and I will have mercy on her. She represents the nation of Israel. It was, a, it was an actually true event, but she also was a symbolic, prophetic picture of what was going on in the nation of Israel. And we are the continuation of God's people. I will sow for myself the earth, and I will have mercy on her who had not obtained mercy. She didn't deserve it. And guys, you know what? You don't deserve it, and neither do I. So get out of yourself. You're not all that in a bag of chips, right? You've heard that before? Okay. Who had not obtained mercy, then I will say to those who were not my people, you are my people. And they shall say, you are my God. So God gives mercy and accepts you, not because of your merits, not because you have your act together, it's because God has selected you. So this is what happens. So we're Gomer. Isn't that good news? We don't have to be Gomer. But we are Gomer. <laughs> but God accepts us. Because all of us have gone our own way. So, you're a chosen race. You're graced and forgiven. And you're God's possession. In other words, God owns you. If God owns you, he takes care of you. If you call me up and say, my bathtub is running and leaking, come over to my house and fix it. First of all, you don't want to call me. I'm terrible. You gave me a hammer to destroy stuff. I'm lousy. I'm, a, I'm probably the worst homeowner you've ever met in your life. I'm terrible. I look at something and it breaks. I'm not good at it. Okay? But I'm sorry. Well, I'm sorry your bathtub's not working. I, I can't help you. But if I own that house and you call me and you're a tenant and say the bathtub's, guess what I have to do? I've got to hire somebody because I can't do it. Okay, but I'm going to have to take, I'm going to have to fix it. Why? It's my responsibility. Why? Because I what? I own it. When you are owned by God, it becomes his responsibility to help you, to work through you. But if you say mine, he can't help you very much. When you say it's my life, it's not your life. You've been bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. It's not my money. It's not my family. This is not my church, by the way. This is a church I pastor. It's not my church. It's not my church. It's not even my own. My life's not even my own. And that's fantastic. You know why? Hey, God, uh, this old body you gave me, my arm's kind of sore. Will you please take care of it for me? Hey, God, you know, I can go to God and say, God, this is your body. This, this is, hey, God, this bank account here I got over here, yeah, it's your bank account. Stop spending so much money. Okay, I'll, I'll do that, but can you, can you lend me that $10, please? You know, <laughs> go to God and ask him for more money. It, when, it, when, it, when it's his, when it's his will, he pays the bill. And this is how it works. So you're God's possession. Now, what's so cool about this is this. Verse 9, you are a people 
for God's own possession. You were once not a people, but now you are the people of God. This is a quote from the book of Hosea. So, so Peter's quoting Hosea and saying, you're Gomer, and now you're owned by God. You know what happened to Gomer? She went to the, she basically kept prostituting herself. She finally went to the slave market. And you know what Hosea did? He bought his own wife back. Twice redeemed. You and I are in a slave market called sin. And Jesus bought us back. Paid in full. Are you going to allow it to take place? That's the beauty of what Christ has done. Isaiah 43.1 says this. But now, O Jacob, listen to the Lord who created you. O Israel. This is going to apply to us today, by the way. The one who formed you says, do not be afraid, for I have ransomed. Ha, you were a, ra a ransom. I paid for your deliverance. I paid. You're off the slave market. You are now owned by me. You see, you're either a slave of the enemy or you're a slave of God. A self-made man is a person, or self-made woman is a person in slavery. Do not be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. So I'm God's property. Okay, if I'm God's property and you're God's property, how am I supposed to treat you? With what? Respect. With honor, right? Absolutely. So until you conquer the fear of being an outsider, an outsider you will remain. If you don't realize who you are in Christ, you'll stay an outsider. You'll be living under a bridge. You'll be living below your means. You must believe. But you must believe that you are good enough because Christ is good enough. And this is the important thing we have to realize. So, you're a chosen race. You're grace and forgiven. You're God's own possession. And you are holy, a holy nation. And the word there for nation is ethnos which is a plurality of people group. So God doesn't just call me, he calls we. Within we, there's me. But there's no me without we. You see, God's called a body. In the Western mindset in America, it's all about the individual. But it was never that way. God died for a people group. He died for you, yes. But you're part of a bigger structure. Yes, you are a stone in the wall of God's fortress. But that stone doesn't really do much with, unless it's connected to the rest of the wall. You see, so God does save you, but he saves us. And we have to get our minds off of just me and God. No, it's not just you and God. It's God and his body. And the reason why we're not functioning as well as we should is because we separated ourselves. There's something that happens when you get in a room with other people going after God. As much as I love being online, as much as I love podcasts and listening to great speakers and motivators and all, I love reading books, but there's something about having another person around you that's going after God. It's something about having a relationship with someone that you can see, you can sense their spirit, you can pray for each other. There's something that happens where two or three are gathered in my name. I am in the midst of them. Now, I'm not make, trying to make you feel guilty for being home, but I'm trying to tell you that there's something special that happens when we gather together. The Bible is very clear about that. Very clear about that. He calls a people, not just a person. So you are a holy nation. Verse 9, you are a holy nation. Because it's written, be holy for I am holy. We talked about holiness last week. It means set apart by God. I like what John Piper said. He said this, you are holy if you do not act in a holy way. You act out of character. You contradict your essence as a Christian. For your identity is holiness to the Lord. You are holy. I like what I read, this present darkness. Uh, Neil Anderson talks about this, and I agree with him 100%. And the Bible talks about this as well. A lot of people would say, well, I'm just a sinner. I'm just, I'm just a no good sinner. You know, and, and, or, you know, I like the Alcoholics Anonymous 12-step uh, program. It's very successful. It's based on a lot of Christian principles. And so one of the ways you get help, and the only way you can get free of something, you have to own it so you can give it away. 
So a lot of people never admit they're an alcoholic or they're, they're a narcotics person. They don't, they don't admit it. So one of the things you do when you go to Alcoholics Anonymous, you would say, hey, my name is Eric Bucci, and I'm an alcoholic. I haven't drank in 25 years. And they all applaud and whatever. Congratulations. But the problem is my identity is wrapped up in my sin and not my Savior. Your identity is not your sin. Your identity is in your Savior. So, yeah, you have to admit it, but there's something fundamentally wrong when we say, I'm just a sinner. No, you're not just a sinner. You're a saint with a sin problem. You have a sin problem. You have a darkness inside. You have someone you need to evict from your house. Like, keep evicting the old man out. He keeps coming back in. He's a squatter. Keep kicking him out. What are you doing here again? Get out. I constantly have to throw them out of the house. And this is what happens. You are a saint. You, you are a saint. You're not an ain't. You're a saint. And God has saved you, right? So you are holy. You have to, if you don't see yourself holy, then you go, well, it, listen, if I, said, if I said to myself, I'm sitting here in the street, and I said, I have $18 million. What am I doing with a shopping cart picking up cans? I have $18 million. I have an inheritance. Why am I living under a bridge? I don't belong here, right? But if I say to myself, well, I'm just a homeless person. I'm no good. I don't have a family. I'm going to live that way. But when you realize who you are, when you fall down, because you will fall down, I don't belong here. I'm a child of God. Do you see that, everybody? Very, very important. So remember, your sin does not define you. Your Savior defines you. So you're a chosen race. You're grace and forgiven. You're God's own possession. You're, you are a holy nation. And you are a royal. Tell someone, you're a royal priest. <laughs> okay. That's just a substitute what you used to say. Okay. That's what we do in church. Okay. You're a royal priest. Boy, he sure is a royal priest. That's what you got to say. <laughs> you are a royal priest. What does that mean? Well. You are a royal priesthood. That means you're part of the king. You're probably the upper echelon. You are a priest. What is a priest? A priest stands before God and the people. A priest goes to God. A priest intersects with God. A priest stands. Now, God has always called us to be a kingdom of priests. I just want to show you in our remaining time here today a little bit of a history lesson of what happened to Israel. Israel was in, in, in captivity and slavery for 430 some odd years. And what happened was they were in Egypt. God raised up a deliverer by the name of Moses. Moses took them with God's leadership and his power and re removed them from Egypt. And here is a summary of that taking place in Exodus. This is God speaking through Moses. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Moses was at the mountain of God, by himself, God called him. He experienced God's presence. God says, I want you now. Go get the people and have them experience what you just experienced. I'm going to make them like you. So that's exactly what he does. So, I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, let me show you something very quickly. The reason why the Israelites were saved was not because they did good works. God saved them before they even knew about good works. He saved them as slaves. He saved them when they were in sin. Okay? So you're not saved because you act good. And a lot of Christians go this way. Well, 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 tell me what it means to be a Christian. Well, you know, I'm a pretty good person. And I don't smoke. I don't chew. I don't go with girls who do. Uh, I don't do this. I don't do that. I, I go to the church. I try to be a good person. And maybe, no, no. You're missing the point, everybody. That's not what we're called. Truth of the matter is, you and I are a wreck without God. You can't do enough to earn God's favor. So God took the Israelites, saved them prior to the law. God saves you prior to the law. But he saves you so now you can apply the law in its proper context, which is relationship, which is health, healing, your design. But if you go to God with Rules, you will never get it. 
You're saved by relationship, and that relationship helps you follow the rules that are for your own good. God created you. He knows what works. But if you think the rules save you, the rules don't save you. A relationship with God saves you. So if you think it's all about doing rules, you're in the wrong, you're in the wrong religion. That's Christian legalism. And then all your life, you do things so you can be accepted by God. If I pass through this church so I'll be liked by God, I'm doing it for the wrong reason. Truth of the matter is I don't deserve anything. God saved me. And I'm doing this because, you know what, he loves you. And I want to be a blessing to God by being a blessing to you. And if I do for that reason, it's a good place, it's a good place to be. And then it's his problem. Not mine. It's not my church. I tell God that sometimes. God, it's not my church. God, this is not me. This is you. Okay. But you yourselves have seen before you, okay? You shall be my treasure, possession among all peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy ethne. God wants us to be a holy nation. Even though we're different ethnicities, even though we have different backgrounds, even though we have different social economic stratus, if you will, we're all the same family in Christ Jesus. That is so important to realize. Now, this is something that happened. God spoke to them and, and, and told them all these things at the mountain. There were a bunch of them. Over a million people sitting at the base of the mountain. God spoke. The, the commandments were spoken, Right? And then something happens. Moses says, consecrate yourself for the next, for three days from now, God's going to meet with you. God meets with them. They're freaking out. There's like fire. They hear the voice of God. I mean, it's, it was unbelievable. So they're like, hey, hey, Moses. Uh, they said to them, Moses, you, you speak to us and, and, and we're listening. But, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. And Moses, you, you, you deal with God. Well, you just tell us what to do. We're okay. I remember when I was in a... In Florida on vacation one time, we uh, had rented a house, my family and I, uh, when I was a kid. And uh, <laughs> I don't know if you noticed, guys, but uh, in Florida, they don't, have, they don't have roaches. They have roaches that are like the size of cars. <laughs> I mean, Volkswagen Beetles. They're like, and so we flipped a switch on in the middle of the night, and all of a sudden, whoa, these, these horrific, horrible, disgusting, flying roaches. I mean, how, who'd ever think of such a thing? So these things, they, they all scour, and they run away from the light, lest they get caught. A lot of people run from the light because they got junk in their life. The people of Israel are like, hey, Moses, we want to keep our roaches to ourselves. You go ahead and you stay in the light. We're going to stay over here. And they lost an opportunity. Something happened. But do not let God speak to us lest we die. Moses said to the people, do not fear, for God has come to test you that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. What? He's telling them not to fear, but to fear. Yes, he's telling them to respect God. I respect electricity. This is why this is working. This is why the lights are on. But if I go in that back room, and we have a back room back there. It's called a back room. Brilliant. And if I take a screwdriver with a metal handle and go, you know what I think I'm going to do? I want to put a little more energy in my life. And I put that in the panel and exposed wired. What's going to happen to me? What will happen to me? I'll be fried bacon, right? I'll die because I don't respect the electricity. But if I respect the electricity and have a godly fear of it, which I happen to have, then I can enjoy its, its benefits. So what God was saying to the people, don't be afraid of God, but fear him. I'm afraid that we don't, we don't fear God. And the beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. The beginning of foolishness is to have no fear of God. A godless nation does godless things. The problem with our country, the problem with you and I, we, we don't have a fear of God. So God wanted them to be a kingdom of priests. To stand before God, to have access. When Jesus died on the cross, uh, uh, that day, the veil was torn in two. That's what happened. So, your identity leads to 
your destiny? What is your identity? Do you know who you are in God? I just shared with you. If you've given your life to Jesus, this is who you are. And God's okay with the fact that you're struggling with it. So am I, everybody. But start believing who you are and let God rewrite your mind, rewrite your DNA, rewrite your body. Let his word that I shared today is sharper than any two-edged sword. It will go to the very marrow of your bones. And that's where things are created. This is not just some poetic thing written in the Bible. It, the word of God, this is what's powerful. I can share my opinions. But what I share with you today is the word of God. And it works. This is not Eric Bucci. This is me bringing you God's word. Apply it and watch what will happen. How do you get this identity? As the worship team makes their way up. There's a little hint to come to come. Pretty smart, huh? Okay. But you... Look at your neighbor and say, here were you. Okay. You are a chosen. God chose you. Okay. It wasn't your idea. God chose you. And you just happened to realize he chose you. So, okay, I'm chosen. You're a chosen race. You are a chosen geos, genos. You are chosen by God. You are a new creation, Christ Jesus. A royal priest. You have the right to go before God. It's my prayer that you guys will get into the word, that you'll read the word for yourself, that you'll open the word for yourself, that you'll share the good things of God with other people. And when you come here on Sunday, it will be gravy time. It will be celebration time. Not waiting for the, the pastor, not waiting for a podcast, not waiting for a preacher. No, I'm, going to, I'm a priest. I go to God. Okay? You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim, that's next week, you may proclaim the excellencies, that's right, of him who called you out of the darkness. Are you living in darkness? The reason you want to run to the light is because what you're doing in the dark, you don't want anyone to know about. It's time to flick the lights on and let the light of God shine upon you. Of him who's called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Remember we talked about Gomer. What happened to her in the slave auction. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Now listen, as we conclude right now, I, I wanted to encourage you to do something. Go back home, and I'm going to write you an Rx. You know when a, you go to the doctor, they write you an Rx? I'm write you an Rx. I want you uh, to go home after the service. And I want you to get 1 Peter open on your phone, whatever. Go to 2, 9, and 10. And I want you to look in your mirror for this next week, next seven days. Look in the mirror. Look at yourself. And read this to yourself. I am a chosen race. I'm a royal priesthood. I'm a part of a holy nation. I'm a people. Of, I'm God's own possession. I'm God's own possession. Say it to yourself. That I may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called me out of darkness into his marvelous light. Speak who you are over yourself. Your identity leads you to your destiny. Are you the Lord's? Guys, we need to live by who we are and whose we are. But let me ask you a question today. Have you actually given your life to Jesus? If all you're trying to do is come to church and be a good person and I'll, I'll tithe, I'll give the missions, I'll go mission trips, but that doesn't save you. Pastoring a church does not save you. Being an author or speaker does not save you. There's only one thing that saves you. When you resign yourself and say, God, I need you and I accept you as my Lord and my Savior. That's it. And that's the beautiful thing. That blows the world away. Everyone's about merit. Everyone's about being better than somebody else. Everyone's trying to show off their stuff. You know what? God showed off his stuff on the cross. All are saved. Have you given your life to Jesus? And so for us that have already done that, I want to remind you of who you are, lest you forget. Because there's a voice always telling you, if you've never given your life, today's the day. I'm going to ask out of reverence for everyone else, you just bow your heads in a few moments and I'm going to ask you a question. If you were to die today, do you absolutely know you'd be in heaven with Jesus? 
The Bible says be absent from the body, be present with the Lord. I know where I'd be. Do you know? Well, I, I'm a pretty good person, and uh, compared to everyone else, that doesn't cut it. There's only one way that you can stand before God. It's because you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and you've given your life to Him. I'm going to say a prayer in a few moments, and if you'll connect to this prayer with your heart, you can begin a new day. Maybe you used to walk with God and no longer are. Maybe you've never surrendered. Today is the day of salvation. Those at home or wherever you're watching right now, as you, as you included, I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you rose again from the dead. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins, both known and unknown. And I step down from being in charge today. I declare you are my God. And this life is yours in Jesus' name. Come fill me now, I pray. Thank you that I am now your child. And your responsibility. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, we believe you began a journey following God. We believe you became born again. And in the front pocket of your seat, there's this card. You can pull it out. If you're in line, you can write at the bottom, or after the service, you can go to Cornerstone Cheshire, and, or you can tell someone right now, be bold, say, I, I prayed that prayer, and you can just put in the bottom there, I prayed that prayer, okay, or you can follow Jesus by calling his phone number, no, I'm just kidding, <laughs> it's not his phone number, 860-499-4888, <laughs> if you go ahead and text that, okay, to and text that. And we'll give you some prompts to help you along the way. Listen, we're all in this together, everybody. We want to help you grow in Christ, all right? That's what's going on. Hey, before we leave, I just wanted to say something else to you as well. I want to give you an opportunity to give. You don't have to give. You get to give. And when you, when you make it, <laughs> when it's God's will, it becomes his bill. But if it, it's my money, guess what? Go ahead, have it your way. When you say, God, everything I have is mine. No, everything I have is yours, God. So, Lord, this is your bank account. Lord, this is your family. Lord, this is your body. The Bible says bring the tithe, that's 10%, to the storehouse, the place you worship. You don't have to, you get to. This is the New Testament, right? But God promises he'll meet all of our needs, not our greeds. So, Father, I pray in Jesus' name, as we give today, I want to thank you. I've seen you take care of my family. I've seen you take care of literally thousands of people. I've seen you take care of throughout the scope of my life. And when we trust you, this is your life. Everything we have is yours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Four different ways you can do it. Cornerstone Cheshire, 77977. You can text to that. Push pay app, cornerstonecheshire.com. Mail it. Or as you walk out of here today, if you're in here, which you are, most of you are, or some of you are, you can go ahead and put it in the box. Okay, everybody? Hey, listen, thank you so much. Easter's on its way. Invite folks. If you could come to the Saturday service and leave room for the Sunday, we'd appreciate it. Thank you so much for being here today. I just want to conclude with this. I'd like to say a blessing over you. You are a child of God. Walk in His blessing. You are chosen by God. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. God's called you out of the darkness into the marvelous light to declare the excellencies of Him. Go in peace and serve the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.